Chapter Fifteen of Stories of Old Greece and Rome by Emily Kip Baker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fifteen Mars and Vulcan. The three children of Jupiter and Juno were Hebe, Mars, and Vulcan. Hebe, goddess of youth, was a cup bearer at the feasts of Olympus and poured from golden flagons the sparkling ruby-tinted nectar. Many times were the brimming cups emptied and filled again, for the gods loved long draughts of the life-giving nectar that kept off all sickness and decay. No wine of earth's yielding ever appeared at these royal banquets, nor were there seen here the heaped-up platters of food such as mortals crave, for the gods ate only of the divine ambrosia, which ensured them to eternal youth and beauty. For so long a time had fair-haired Hebe served at the feasts of Olympus that the gods never thought that she could be deprived of her office. But once, as she was handing Jupiter a well-filled cup, she stumbled and fell, and the ruler of men and gods was so angry that he vowed that she should never again be a cup-bearer. Since no one among the gods was willing to fill this humble position, Jupiter was obliged to seek over the earth for some mortal to take the place of poor disgraced Hebe. To make the journey as speedily as possible, he assumed the form of an eagle, and spent many days soaring over the land, before he found the youth whose slender grace made him feel assured that its possessor would be able to serve the gods less awkwardly than Hebe. On the sunny slopes of Mount Ida he saw a group of youths playing games, and among them was one whom Jupiter determined to bear away at once to Olympus. This was Ganymede, a prince of Troy and the fact that he was no common mortal, but a king's son, did not deter Jupiter from sweeping down upon the astonished youth, and carrying him aloft on his wings. Whether Ganymede was happy in Olympus we do not know, but the story goes that he remained forever at Jupiter's side, and the city of Troy never saw him again, nor did the king his father ever know the reason for his strange disappearance. Mars was the god of war and though he was the least loved of all the deities in Olympus, he was the one most feared by the people of every land. As he was always a hater of peace, and would stir up strife among men for the mere delight of fighting and bloodshed, the poet Homer calls him the slayer of men, one steeped in blood, the destroyer of walled towns. His shrines were never wreathed with flowers, nor were children often found among the people grouped about his altars, Instead of the yearling ox with gilded horns, men sacrificed a savage bull to the god, who took no pleasure in the tame shedding of blood. Sometimes Bellona, goddess of war, accompanied Mars in his chariot to watch over his safety, and since she was equally eager to urge men on to bloody fighting, their appearance together on the battlefield brought terror to the bravest heart. Seldom were prayers addressed to these two deities, except those of vengeance upon enemies, and there was little hope of peace for the nation when men thronged the temples where Mars and Bellona were jointly worshipped. The fiercest passions were kindled at their shrines, and their altars were the only ones that were ever defiled by human sacrifices. Though so fierce in warfare, Mars was as susceptible to love as were all the immortals, for he was not only the chosen one of the golden-haired Venus, but was also the devoted lover of the vestal Rhea Sylvia. This maiden, being dedicated to the goddess Vesta, did not dare to listen to any words of love until her time of service in the temple was over, for the penalty of breaking her solemn vows would be the terrible one of being buried alive. But Mars was not to be denied. So at last the Vestal yielded, but kept her marriage secret, and continued to live in the temple until the birth of her twin sons, Romulus and Remus. When her parents learned that she had failed to keep the sacred promise made at the altar fire at Vesta, they demanded that she should suffer the prescribed punishment. She was therefore taken, at night, into an underground room of the temple, and enclosed in the wall which had been built to allow for just such a tragic event. As her children were declared outcasts, they were taken into the forest and left to perish by the teeth of wild beasts. Romulus and Remus did not die, however for a she-wolf carried them to her lair, and reared them with her own cubs. Later on they were found by a kindly shepherd, who took care of them, until they grew to manhood. Then they left him, and went out into the world to seek adventures. 
which soon ended in Romulus killing his brother Remus, and himself becoming the founder of Rome. When this new city was well established, Mars was made its patron deity and protector, and before an army set out on any military campaign, the leader would first go into the temple where the sacred shield, the Anchile, hung, and, touching it, fearfully would pray, O Mars, watch over us. This shield was carefully guarded in Rome, for upon it depended the safety of the city. It was a special token sent by the god of war, to show that the people of Rome were under his protection. For once, when a plague was raging among them, and the dead were numbered by thousands, the Romans fled to the temple of Mars, and begged him to help them. As they were praying, a shield fell from the skies into their midst, and a voice told them that as long as this, the sacred Anchile, was with them, no harm could come to Rome. That day the plague ceased, and ever afterward the shield was jealously guarded. To ensure its safety, eleven other shields were made so like the Anchile that no one but the Sali, the priests of the temple, knew which it was. These were carried in the streets during the festivals in honour of Mars, which were held in March, the month that bears his name, and as the priests bore aloft the shields, they sang war songs, and performed rude war dances. Sometimes the shields were displayed on the broad grounds, where soldiers and youths of the city held their exercises. This place was dedicated to the god of war, and was called the Campus Martius, or Field of Mars. During the war between the gods and the giants, Mars was so eager to prove his skill in warfare that he engaged in a fierce battle with Otus and Ephialtes. These two giants were only nine years old, but they were already of immense size, as they increased in height at the rate of nine inches every month. The young giants were very proud of having conquered the god of war, and carried him off the battlefield in triumph. They bound Mars with iron chains, and kept a careful guard over him, so that none of the gods could set him free. Whenever Mars attempted to escape at night, believing that the giants were asleep, the rattle of the chains woke his guardians, and all the hope of rescuing him was over. In this disgraceful bondage, the unhappy Mars lingered for fifteen months, until Mercury, the Prince of Thieves, unfastened the chains, and restored the god to freedom. When Cadmus went on his search for his sister Europa, whom Jupiter, in the form of a white bull, had carried off to a distant land, the devoted brother was at last bidden to give up his hopeless quest, to settle in the country, later called Biotia, and to found a city there. Cadmus was glad to rest after his long march, and he sent some of his men in search of a spring. When they did not come back, he sent others to look for them, and when these did not return, he went himself to see what had caused all this delay. He carried his sword in his hand, and also a long spear, for he guessed that some disaster had overtaken his men. He wandered some time before he discovered any trace of them, and then, at the edge of a forest, he came upon the lifeless body of one of those who had first set out to find the spring. As he went farther into the forest, he found others of his men, all of them lifeless, and soon he came to a large cave, at the entrance of which bubbled a fountain of purest water. Not knowing that this was a grove sacred to Mars, and a fountain that had never been polluted by mortal touch, Cadmus stooped to drink. When, suddenly, out of the deep shadows of the cave, rushed a huge dragon, with crested head and glittering scales, and a triple tongue vibrating between triple rows of teeth. This monster, twisting his body into a huge coil, darted towards Cadmus with gleaming fangs, but the young prince dealt his assailant a terrific blow that pierced the dragon in a vital spot, and it rolled over dead upon the floor of the cave. Then Cadmus heard a voice telling him to take out the dragon's teeth, and to sow them in the ground where he wished to build his future city of Thebes. As soon as the teeth were sown, a crop of giants in glittering armour sprang up out of the ground, and when they were about to turn their spears upon Cadmus, he again heard the voice, this time bidding him throw a stone into the midst of the armed men. This caused a terrific battle to begin among the giants themselves, and soon they were all killed, except five who laid down their weapons and offered their services to Cadmus. As a punishment for the desecration of his grove, and the slaying of its sacred guardian, Mars compelled Cadmus to serve him for eight years. At the end of this time the prince was made ruler of the new city of Thebes, and Mars so far forgave the sacrilege of his grove as to give Cadmus his daughter Harmonia in marriage. The career of the new king was very prosperous at first, 
and Cadmus was supposed to have contributed a great boon to his people by the invention of the alphabet. Later on he incurred the wrath of the gods by forgetting to offer them suitable sacrifices, and both he and his wife Harmonia were changed into serpents. Just above the city of Athens was a hill, called the Areopagus, from the Greek word meaning Mars Hill, which received its name from a famous trial that took place there. Neptune's son had carried off the daughter of Mars, and when the god of war learned of the abduction, he hurried after the daring youth and killed him. Then Neptune demanded that Mars should be punished for his deed of blood, and to decide the matter both were summoned to appear before a court of justice, which was held on the hill above Athens. As it was the custom for all important cases to be tried at night, so that the judges might not be prejudiced by the favourable appearance of either party, the court assembled in the darkness, and Mars told the story of his daughter's capture, and his own subsequent revenge. In spite of Neptune's objections to what he considered an unfair verdict, the judges decided in favour of Mars, and he was therefore acquitted. The hill was afterwards called by his name, and the judges of the principal court of justice were always termed Areopagite. Vulcan, god of fire and the forge, was not often seen in the halls of Olympus, for he knew that the gods despised him for his ungainly appearance, and he preferred to stay in his own sooty workshop. He had also no desire for the society of his divine parents, since his mother had never shown anything but indifference toward him, and his father had been the cause of his deformity. Jupiter was once so angry with Juno for interfering in his love affairs, that he fastened her to the end of a strong chain, and hung her out of heaven. Vulcan, seeing his mother in this sad plight, dragged at the chain, and finally succeeded in drawing Juno into safety. Full of wrath at this defiance of his wishes, Jupiter kicked his son out of heaven, and as the distance of the fall was so great, it was a whole day and night before Vulcan reached the earth. Had he been a mortal, there would have been nothing left to tell the story of his meteor-like descent, but being a god he still lived, and had only a slight deformity and lameness as the result of his fall. When he learned that Juno was so unconcerned over his fate that she never even inquired whether he was badly hurt, he would not go back to Olympus, but shut himself up in the heart of Mount Etna, where he established a mighty forge that poured out fire and smoke for many years after. Vulcan did not forget about his mother's heartless indifference, but none of the gods suspected him of harbouring any revenge, until one day a beautiful golden throne arrived in Olympus, as a present to Juno from her son. The goddess admired the exquisite designs carved on its polished surface, and seated herself in it proudly. Now Vulcan had contrived to hide some springs in the interior of the throne, and these were so skilfully arranged, that the moment a person was seated, the entire structure quickly contracted and held the occupant prisoner. So in a moment proud Juno found herself securely caught, and no assistance that the gods could render her was of the least avail. Then Jupiter sent Mercury to the grimy abode of Vulcan, to beg politely that the god of fire would honour, with his presence, the feast that was that day to be held in Olympus. But Vulcan was not to be moved by any flattery, for he well knew why he was so much desired at this particular time. So Mercury returned alone to Olympus, and Jupiter was obliged to think of some other device for luring Vulcan from his forge. This time he sent Bacchus, god of wine, and when the scowling deity of Etna saw Bacchus's jolly red face and heard his hearty laugh, he welcomed the jovial visitor, and drank freely of the wine that Bacchus poured. The roisterous god of revels, who clearly loved to see good wine flowing, beguiled Vulcan into taking draught after draught of the choice vintage that he had purposely brought, until the sullen master of the forge was unable to tell what was happening, and allowed himself to be led unresistingly to Olympus. Once there the gods persuaded him to release the repentant Juno, and to allow himself to be reinstated in Jupiter's favour. Though Vulcan grudgingly complied with these requests, he would not consent to live in Olympus, but returned to his workshop in Mount Etna. There he made many things out of gold and precious stones, and gave them to the gods, as an evidence that he no longer bore them any ill-will. Their golden thrones were made by Vulcan's crafty hands, and the wonderful palaces, with all their costly furnishings, were the best result of his skill. He also forged Jupiter's thunderbolts, and fashioned the weapons that the gods used in battle. He made Apollo's marvellous sun-chariot, 
and even deigned to use his skill in shaping the arrows that Cupid used in his golden bow. When Jupiter decreed that laughter-loving Venus should wed his misshapen son, Vulcan took his reluctant wife to the smoky workshop in Mount Etna, and for a while Venus was amused at the unusual sights and sounds that greeted her in her new home, but she soon wearied of the dirt and darkness, and left the society of her surly husband to return to Olympus, where there was plenty to delight her pleasure-loving soul. End of chapter 15